Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hyperconscious Podcast. Alan, what is Hyperconscious? Once you understand why something is the way that it is, now you have the power to change it. Great conversations with great people and great questions are the keys to the kingdom of unlocking your consciousness. Every single action that you do starts as a thought. When you control the way you think, you will control the way you act, and you will control the way you live. That is hyperconscious. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another very special, as always, episode of the Hyperconscious Podcast. Today, Alan and I were lucky enough to sit down in person with the one and only Mark Metry. He is the host and the creator of the Humans 2.0 Podcast, and he actually interviewed us to be on his show, but we are going to use it as an episode because I feel like there was a ton of value. Both of our podcasts are very congruent because it's all about awareness, raising your awareness, raising the ability to make good decisions towards your long-term goals. It's really awesome because Mark is now a close friend of ours, and the dynamic has shifted quite a bit since the last time we had him on. Yeah, we get to go to the gym with him every Friday. We get to mastermind. Um, He is a next-level speaker and... Honestly, he has a very successful podcast. He's mentored by billionaires, so you don't get mentored by billionaires on accident. Uh, This was a fire episode. Yes, it was. We hope you will enjoy. Talk soon. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, the Hyperconscious Podcast is proudly sponsored by our friend and mentor, David Meltzer, of the Playbook Podcast. He was kind enough to join us on episode 144 and 135. Folks, it has become Kevin and I's mission in life to help you realize that the life of your dreams is right on the other side of you becoming the greatest version of yourself. Let us help you do that. I rarely do these things twice in such a short amount of time, but you guys impress me. I I believe in people that provide value and of our service. You two guys are on your way to huge fulfillment, purpose, and profitability, and I look forward to helping you both. We appreciate that more than you know. What's going on? Look at my pit stain. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mark Metry. Today I'm here with the legendary... Here, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? I am Kevin Palmieri. I am the host and the creator of the Hyperconscious Podcast. And a rapper. And a rapper and a peak performance coach and a speaker as well. My name is Alan Lazarus. I am a public speaker, a model, a men's physique fitness athlete, a fitness peak performance coach, and a podcaster, and the co-host... Of the hyperconscious podcast. Some would say. Absolutely. Dude. Some would say. First and foremost, thank you guys for having me in your home. Absolutely. Amazing, Alan's home. Amazing studio, amazing home, amazing lake out front. Thank you. Uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm super glad to be back here for a second time. I first found out about you guys. What was it? You guys just reached out to me on Instagram. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And like, yo, come on our podcast all the way back in February, March. We saw you doing big things, and we were like, there's no way that kid is only. I think you were 21 21, at the time, and and we were blown away by the fact that you have experienced so much so early on, and you also have so many things in the works, and you're consistently changing the world, and we're all about that. Yeah, man, a lot of things in the works. I've tried my best, but um, I, you know, we've uh, we've built a fantastic relationship together, both of us. I remember I came in this podcast, we had a you know great time, and you know you guys are just you know so you know, focused on, you know, trying to find a way to help me. And I told you guys, you know, you guys are ripped. I'm trying to get ripped. And, you know, you you guys are the ones that helped me out with that. And so, you know, I got pit stains. We just came back from the gym. (laughs) You probably noticed my... I'm building a little bit of muscle. I've been at this for uh, for a few months now. I've been going to the gym with them on uh, Fridays. And um, we've just been killing it. And you guys are two, like, really, really unique individuals. Very far from a lot of the people that I talk to. Uh, just by your behavior, the way that you guys communicate and think, I think it's so unique. And so I was like, we got to have these guys on the Humans 2.0 podcast and, you know, learn about these guys. He's going to have a lot to teach you. We appreciate that so much, right. man. I think um, uh, Alan and I always talk so highly of you. And it's just, number one, the fact that you were just so willing to jump into the gym, like something you really right. aren't that comfortable doing. You just show up to the gym and you just come with us. I know. So I wanted to ask you, is that something that... Like, are you afraid 
when you walk into the gym for the first time with us? Like, what was it like coming into the gym with us for the first time? Yeah, I mean, I honestly, I don't, I don't remember being intimidated or afraid. Maybe I was like a little bit off, but honestly, bro, I just feel like I've literally <laughs> spent most of my life <laughs> in that state <laughs> that I was just like, you know, new environment, right. like it's just external stuff and. You know, if you sort out the internal, like, you know, try to get that on the study going and, you know, everything else is just the same thing. Yeah. So earlier <laughs> we were talking in the gym and you said that it has been, you and I figured out that it's been five months since you yeah. came on the Hyperconscious podcast and now it's Humans 2.0 meets Hyperconscious. So, so happy to be here. You and I talked about how much has changed in the last five months and that it's absolutely insane. And I asked you, what's the one thing that you think made the biggest difference? Um, yeah, so honestly, when I look back at my life in March, completely different, just completely different to what I'm doing now, to the things that I'm doing. And honestly, like, you know, I said this to you before, um, you know, I've been trying to improve every day, but honestly, I just think it's from the, you know, the accumulations of all the actions that you build up. And, you know, I definitely feel that I've moved, become more successful, internally happier, Honestly, but I also think that I have, like, as I've been going on my journey, I've also been, you know, uncovering and becoming more aware of different things that I have in my life. And so it's, uh, it's just a really crazy time to, um, to be alive and, like, on the, on the business, like, on the professional side. I mean, it's, like, literally night and day between, like, just where things are going and, like, business and, and life and I'm just... Uh, Super, super grateful, and I can't wait for, like, five months from now in March. Wait, is that March? Wait, I'm really bad at math. Is that March? Or no, that's January. Like, yeah. <laughs> January. January. <laughs> January, 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 February. January of uh, 2020 to be like, damn, like, because I really think things are uh, exponential, you know? And yes. like, you show up one day after another. You know, we've had a lot of mutual guests on, like, David Melter. They talk about the zero effect and how if you just show up every day again and again and again, you know, you just speed that up, and it gets exponential. And, um, you know, honestly, I don't think it was one thing. I, th I just feel like it was just everything. And I also feel like going to the gym has also been a great outlet for me. And, uh, and um, you know, just gaining more experiences, uh, seeking new just activities that I figured out I love doing and just, uh, just trying to have a fun time in life while trying to progress but not trying to take it too seriously so I don't, you know, repeat what happened in my life. Right. <laughs> so you've had some of the most successful guests. So if you're listening to this, you know my... Are you okay? Can we pause for a second and yeah. ask you guys a question? Yeah. yeah. So on the Humans 2.0 podcast, what I'd like to do is I'd love, it, I'd love it if each one of you guys could, you know, talk about your Humans 2.0 moment. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, not everybody has one of these, but I think every human, and I, I think we always have, and I don't think there's one of them, but there's usually like some kind of a watershed moment. Maybe it's you become conscious of something. Maybe you just shift your behavior. Maybe an event forces you to see something differently. I'd love it if both of you guys could just... Talk about like the most profound humans 2.0 moment you've had in your life. Sure, absolutely. Well, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna hammer it. Hit it hit you it. do it. Um, so, just for those of you, since you don't know me, I was um, I was a construction foreman who traveled up and down the East Coast. Um, I made a lot of money doing what I I did, and from the outside, it looks like I had my dream life. I had an unbelievably beautiful girlfriend. I had a very full bank account. I had a brand new car. I had the body of my dreams. Uh, I had a brand new apartment, so from the outside, it seemed like I was very successful. But how old were you? Uh, I was twenty-five. Okay. So from the outside, a twenty-five-year-old with no college degree, making hundred thousand dollars a year, seemed like a pretty That's good dope. seemed like a pretty good thing. But inside, I was living a nightmare, and nobody really knew about that. So I traveled, like I said, for ten months out of the year, one year, and. I'll never forget, I was sitting on the edge of a hotel bed in, in a crusty room in uh, New Jersey, and I just, I, I put it like this, I couldn't turn the voices in my head off. There was just so much noise going on in my head. And I remember just sitting at the edge of the bed, and I thought to myself, I can't live like this anymore. So at that moment, I truly would have rather been dead. Like, I wanted to die. Wait, wait, so, so you had the money, but what, what was, what do you think was making you feel like that? I, it was something within me that I had never... I used to use so many outside forces to try to block the pain that I was feeling inside. So I grew up without a father. Um, I had an interesting childhood. My mom was great. My grandmother was great. But I always felt like I was missing something. And I never felt like I could truly be a man because I didn't have a man around me. I didn't know how to be a man. Right? So 
I always use beautiful women or money or maybe tattoos or maybe being in shape as kind of a block right. to, to show what I really was. Alan always says that, like, I thought you were a badass because I used to just show up to the gym in my hoodie, my loud car, and everybody thought I was a badass, but inside I wasn't. I was unbelievably self-conscious. I had zero confidence, zero. Anxiety, depression. Uh, this time, sitting on the edge of the bed was the third or fourth time I thought about killing myself. So I was dealing with, like, I was dealing with a, a lot, but nobody will ever ask what you're going through if you seem like you're unbelievably happy. Right. Interesting. Right? So true. Yeah? Dude, uh, what's his face? Uh, you guys know the actor Terry Crews? Who? Mm -mm. Terry Crews. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's, you'll, you'll know if you see him, but I was listening to this interview he did. He says, success is the best place to hide. Mm. And it's just like, when you are in that, I've definitely experienced that. Like, that's a, you know what I mean? Like, that's where you wow. actually, you know, hit the deep yeah. dungeon. Yeah, yeah. And nobody's going to ask because yeah. it's like, why would you ask me if I'm okay if I'm showing every sign that I am okay? Yeah. So in that moment where I'm thinking, I remember I texted Alan and said, yo, I don't know what to do. Like, I genuinely wanted to kill myself. I wanted to end it all. I saw no way out. I saw no way, I had no future. And I remember, so looking back in that moment, it was the worst moment of my life, but it was also the best because that was my... Humans 2.0 version. I had to shed the old person I was to become the new person I am today. And in that moment, I realized that I wanted to be the person that I needed at my lowest point. I went all in on the podcast. I quit my job. I became a coach. I became a speaker. Um, and then my life two years later is completely different. Like you said, it's when you start living for something greater than the, just the money or greater than just the, uh, the cars or the watches or whatever it may be, then you become something else. You have to become something else if you want to affect others. So that was my humans 2.0 moment. Damn, man. Fire. I appreciate it. Dude, uh, real quick, like, you know, my take on, uh, you know, suicide is that, uh, you know, for me personally, you know, when I was also uh, had similar experiences, you know, it's like the suicide is sort of like, it's almost like, it's almost like, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to find your way through like self-development. And you just think that this is the next good thing that you should do. But it's because you have limited awareness. You have, you know, I, for me, like, you know, I had a, you know, very limited coping skills mm. or, you know, when things go, you know, when things happen in life, how do you deal with that? And I feel like a lot of us aren't taught that because, you know, we're basically from, you know, once you get into kindergarten, you basically spend most of your life trying to learn about like geography and, right. math, and math, not actually like how to deal with your emotions. So then when something does come, you want to do that. And for me, the whole thing behind suicide is like, my opinion is that, and I felt this, I was trying to kill, not myself, but just kill off a version mm. of myself. And well, you, you both did. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, and it's like, I feel like for people that do experience those moments of feeling suicidal, like as horrible as enough to say and like watch what I'm saying. It's like, it's actually a good thing for you to happen. It's actually a, a moment where, you know, the universe guy, whatever you believe in, I feel like it's trying to push you and be like, dude, you've got to evolve, bro. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what this I mean? This is now or so never. You can't keep escaping this. Before Alan, do, can I ask a question before Alan tells oh, his story? Dude, please do your thing. What this do you, and if this is too deep, pretend I didn't ask, but what do you think the difference between somebody like you and I who had the option and chose to keep living and live better versus somebody who does try to actually take their own life. Like, do you think there's, what do you think the disconnect there is? Honestly, man, I have no idea, but, um, you know, I've, uh, you know, I've had a handful of people that I've known that have, uh, you know, committed suicide. And I, I honestly, like, even though I went to that spot, like right now, I can't even imagine mm. being in a spot where I'd ki try, to ki try to kill myself. Like that just seems um, like really, really uh, horrible. But I think maybe, maybe the, maybe the difference is, um, honestly, I think it has a lot to do with uh, just like your, like your childhood and your, like just the way that you grew up, uh, like your traumatic experiences uh, that have created basically your psychology that enables you to see the future. And if you've never been taught how to see the future, then you're just going to, you're not going to have hope and right. you're not going to have something to live for. Right. Because if you cannot envision a brighter future of so on some level, then you won't have hope. Yeah. And on top of that, you're also going to do things that you would totally regret. 
So for example, it could be suicide and then it could also be like, um, I don't know, you know, being a terrorist and saying, I'm going to, you know, blow myself up with a bomb because I don't have any hope. I don't have a future to look forward to. And so I feel like that's like, I feel like th- like that in and of itself is just like a major, uh, problem not problem but just an element that's mm. like really really deep in the world i think for forever but i think now we're like we can see it and dissect it and it's just like you know i don't want to go on a tangent or anything but it's like honestly i th- I feel like a hundred years ago or 200 years ago if you know we talked about somebody committing suicide nobody would care and the reason why i say that is i actually had no idea but death used like human life used to be something that wasn't even valued mm. and it seems so strange now but I had uh, the founder of Taser on my podcast and he came out with this book called The End of Killing. And it's basically talking about how the latest technology is eventually going to create a world where killing has become uh, has become obsolete. Um, and I'm not going to go too into it, but he was basically telling me that on Sunday nights or Friday nights, the entertainment was people gathering up together in the town and watching like local criminals get hanged. And like, if you just look at the kinds of stuff that was going on, it wasn't even valued at all. And so when it comes to suicide, I honestly don't think that was that much of a problem that the global conscious of humanity actually cared about until like maybe like the last 50 years. Um, And so I just, you know, I just think that this is something that we really have to, uh, you know, pursue because, you know, as much as I'm sure you guys will agree with me, but people that have gone to that like dark side, so to speak, if they're able to come back, they're able to do stuff way better than people. They're able to apply that same like survival mindset and just shift it all around and become uh, like really better. Like I, like I was in Florida, I was in Orlando as you guys were too, or Florida uh, at the beginning of this month. And I, I was speaking next to this guy and he was a drug addict. He was addicted to like, all kinds of drugs. He was homeless on the street for like 10 years. And he was telling me, he's like the same mindset that I had as an addict of like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, we got to get $300 today to yeah. buy heroin. And he's like, he's like, dude, I'm literally doing that today with the organization that I have now. And like with all the positivity that I'm building over that, but same with the, with the same infrastructure. And so it's like, you know, you look at the statistics, 800,000 people are committing suicide every year. Dude, that's 800,000 people that could just like completely change the world right. for all we know. And so, wow. Yeah. I mean, that was a, quite a nice tangent. Yeah, no, your perspective I do. is so interesting yeah. to me. I, the I, historical yeah. part of it. Yeah. Wow. Well, I don't have any of that info. So, the, like, I didn't know any of that, really. Oh, awesome. I resonated deeply with what you said regarding human life not being as valued. I think it's, I mean, you look at like old wars and stuff, and it used to be like die in battle was like a good thing, probably because. You know, a lot of the lives back then were a lot more difficult, and they maybe weren't quite as um, luxurious. Now, I think we hold a higher value to life because our life is more. I mean, we're very uh, spoiled in comparison to history. There's yeah. so much more contrast now. Right. Back then, everybody was kind of just trying to survive. Trying to survive, and now it's like Tom has the new iPhone. You have the <laughs> iPhone five. People, and, <laughs> but so but funny. and it is. It's like, and then people make fun of you because you have you don't have the newest sneakers on. I think a lot of the and obviously we'll get off the suicide thing in a minute, but um, I think a lot of, the, of, of what happens is people get so overwhelmed with judgment and they think, how big of a deal was the stuff that happened to us in high school? We thought it was the end of the world. Oh, right. And I we think didn't have the emotional resilience to cope and with that. We also didn't have people buzzing us online all the time saying, yo, you're a loser. Oh, dude. Like, you should just kill yourself. That's what a lot of kids are doing. We've talked about that a couple times. Brandon Farstein said people told yeah. him to go kill himself because he was diagnosed with dwarfism from a young age. Yeah. And, and they were trying to, they had a bet on Twitter to see who could kick him off his segue. Right. Like, dude, that shit Damn. bothers yeah, it's, me it's, so it's crazy. much. It's crazy. Because we've all had those rock bottom moments where we were made fun of or hurt in some way that we we had to figure out how to cope with that. What if you don't have the coping mechanism? You know, like, you talked on, what episode was it with Andrew Copeland, where he, you were there for him at a tough time. I think that's another thing that makes the difference, is someone who cares about you. Like, you reached out to me. Copeland reached out to you. Yeah. I don't know if, if when you were considering suicide, if you reached out to someone, but I think that's a common denominator, knowing you're not alone. Mm. I reached out, I had a moment where I was, 
unbelievable. I don't even know if I've ever told you this. Oh, let's go. Um, I bought a $300 program of how to cope with depression. Um, this is like before my two, Humans 2.0 moment, but this was one of the many ones leading up to it where I was in my car. I had parked and I was bawling my eyes out kind of because I felt like insignificant and like it didn't matter and and I was so miserable but no one else knew it because like Kevin I had all the outward success and I was projecting happiness when I was around other people when I was alone I was no longer putting on a show right um and I was not drinking I was just hung over or whatever so I called this hotline late night and this woman talked to me about how she was like depressed for a really long time and I bought a program I think it's still in my room I only ended up listening to the first CD because after that I got into personal development and then I had another catalyst my humans 2.0 moment where I really dove deep into purpose and meaning and I found my dreams and actually started chasing them again and whether it's you or Kevin or anyone else who has that rock bottom moment I truly believe that seeing that there's a quote that I live by that you've probably heard me say you cannot see the stars during the day they're always there but sometimes it takes the darkness to see clearly that which you simply could not within the light. I truly believe that if you sit in that dark place long enough, you're going to see your true north, the north star, that guiding light of like, that's what I'm here for. But most people escape it with a vice. They either smoke a joint or drink alcohol. And I'm not judging anyone who does that. I've, I've done both of those things. Mm-hmm. The point is, is if you were to sit and in the pain and not escape it, not escape it, but sit in it, you're going to see your purpose, I believe. And after that, you're so powerful because now you're living for something greater. And all of the things we think we want in life, I think, are a byproduct of that mission. So that's my uh, fire thing. <laughs> Going off on tangents so all over the place. Yeah, I love this. <laughs> no, just so many things are flowing through my, my, my brain. And, uh, and I... Uh, wait, wait. So what was your Humans 2.0 moment? So... Um, that was a mini one. Right. I have a couple other mini ones. Okay. Uh, one at work where I was punching the ceiling saying, never again will I work for someone else. There's a bunch of mini ones, but here's the big one. So for those of you who don't know me, I lost my father in a car accident. Actually, when he was 28 years old, I was two years old. And his the anniversary of his death was actually yesterday. So when I was 26, I got in a car accident up in New Hampshire with my little cousin. And I'll never forget it. The road stayed right. I thought it stayed left, and I was supposed to yield, and I didn't. So this was entirely my fault. I was looking down at the GPS. I think we are going to, like, TJ Fridays or something. And I remember seeing a lift-kitted truck in front, and it was, like, the brightest lights I'd ever seen. This was an obnoxiously lift-kitted truck, too, in New Hampshire. And I remember thinking, oh, in that moment, it was definitely the, this could be it. I have a picture that I usually show in my speeches of that my car was like totaled man somehow in a 2001 volkswagen passat fortunately those things are steel traps steel those things are like really like tanks i i really love that that car that car saved our life all the airbags went off too so me and my cousin i got scratched up in my face he hurt his knee a bit but we were okay but in that moment dude i was so messed up mark like i went back to his place and i was in an armchair drinking whiskey contemplating everything I use an analogy. It's like that shook the snow globe. Everything I thought I knew was like null and void. Would I be proud of the man I'd become? Did I chase my dreams? Did I have the legacy I would have wanted? If that was it, would I be happy with the way I lived my life? And the answer was no, man. It was very, very much no. So fast forward a little while, I was still in the dark. This is before I found my true north. I found a book by Bronnie Ware, who we just interviewed last yes. week. Yes. Which is amazing. And I have a flashcard in my pocket right now with the top five regrets of the dying. She has a book that she wrote called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. She has a TED Talk. If no one has listened to this TED Talk or watched or read this book, please do. This will change your perspective forever. She worked in hospice, and she took care of the terminally ill. And she heard, I wish, I wish, I wish. She heard all of their regrets, and she started noticing patterns. The number one regret of the dying is, I wish I had lived a life true to myself and not what others expect of me. And I was always doing what I thought I was supposed to do, not what I really wanted to do. And when you meet with death, whether it's the death of a loved one or the death of a pet or a health issue or your own suicide, you have to go like, am I proud of the man or woman I've become? Did I chase my dreams? courageously did I serve the world did I leave it a better place and most importantly did I love as fiercely and openly as possible because fear holds us back fear of judgment holds us back so damn much I can't tell her I love her what if she rejects me 
But it, when you face death, there's no downside to telling someone you love them. As a matter of fact, that's the moments you say that shit and you do that and you say, I love you and I always have and I wish I told you earlier. So to me, that was my rock bottom moment. And here's the other thing. 450 people went to my dad's funeral and he had so much impact in such a short time. He was only here for 28 years and I was 26 when this happened. So for me, it was like, whoa. Like I know I have a deep emotional connection to legacy because I see it. I still hear stories about my dad all the time. And the effect we have on others is so much more than we can fathom in this life. And I know that because I am hearing this from my family and my family's friends. And I was just on Facebook yesterday. My sister posted um, his grave and put flowers on it. And so many people reached out. It's just a whole thing. He's still impacting us all these years later. And it's like, if we can live with that perspective, it will change the game for everybody. So that was my rock bottom moment. That's why I encourage everyone to have dreams and a mission greater than themselves because when you live for something bigger, everything you want will be a byproduct of that. Fire. Holy crap. Dude, it's that's crazy everything you just said. And you know, for me, like literally on my phone, every single day I have a reminder that goes off that says, You're gonna die one day. No kidding. Yeah. And the reason why it says that is for that exact thing that you know whatever you call it, like that reconciliation almost with death and saying like you know when you're throughout your every day you don't normally think about just dying right but in some part of your mind in some part of your psyche you do and you could even say that you know the reason why you know you potentially were uh you know you know, hitting the ceiling, what you just said, I was saying, you know, you weren't going to work here or maybe the reason why you were on your bed or, you know, the reason where I got to my low point was maybe because I knew that my death was coming. You know that, like, there's some part of your deep mind, even if you try to hide it in your conscious mind, you try to hide it. Right. And, and you down, know you're not living. You know you're going to die. Right. At and some you know point. You're not you're not living to the accordance. And so right. I feel like there's a lot of, like, like really deep seated pain that maybe comes from that. And it's just like, I mean, it, like it's such a powerful lesson for people to understand. Yeah, go ahead. No. So I, I just think you're just, I had a breakthrough with when you were just talking there. It's like, I know somewhere that I'm wasting my, this gift. Life right. is a gift. And I have not, I'm, I'm limit. I'm not maximizing my potential growth and contribution to me is what it always comes down to. Have you ever heard of Tony Robbins six needs? Go for it. Um, certainty, uncertainty, significance, love, growth, and contribution. The first four needs we all find a way to meet. Certainty is basically security. If we don't know this floor is going to hold up, nothing else matters, right? <laughs> uncertainty is variety. What if you know when it's going to happen, what's going to happen, all that? Variety, we need surprise. We call them problems when it's a surprise we don't want, but we need them to grow. So, And if you always knew what was going to happen and when it was going to happen, it would, you'd be bored. Right, You need variety. The third one is significance. This is my biggest driver, one of my biggest drivers. Wanting to be unique. Wanting to be exceptional. Wanting to be extraordinary. Mastery-driven people are usually here. Tom Brady's definitely driven by that. Um, number four is love and connection. These are people who are very warm, open, loving, honest, sincere, and they, they, they love. We all have all four, but we have syntax. Which one's most important? We're all wired a certain way, right? Um, so that's the, the fourth one. The fifth one is growth. We must grow. If we don't feel like we're growing, we're dying. And this is why it's important to have a brighter future that you believe in because it'll force you to grow. This is why I want everyone to have dreams. If you had dreams, you're going to have to grow. And by the way, if oh, you have yeah. an ego, you're going to get humbled. And Pain. if you don't have confidence, you're going to build confidence. Painful. Right? And then the sixth one is contribution. You must contribute beyond yourself. And the more you grow, the more you crave to contribute and the more you can contribute and the more you contribute, the more you want to grow. And I think that that's the need. When you said earlier, I would never contemplate suicide now, it's because you're living a life with all six needs. Yeah. I, I said that the other day. Right. I could never envision myself on the edge of that bed again. This is a different life. It's almost like it's I really stepped through a portal to another world. Yeah. And the things that used to matter don't matter anymore. Like, yeah. it's okay that everything's not okay because I know it will be okay, <laughs> but better yeah. eventually. Yeah. And it's, it, I don't know how to explain it. Like, I don't know how I lived 26 years in that old exactly. world. Yeah. 
I don't get it. He said yesterday, I'm more afraid of not being able to help someone on a bed in New Jersey yeah. than I am about me being there again. Right. Exactly. And I'm under the most pressure I've ever been. But it's fine because, again, when you're trying to change the world, if you don't feel pressure, you're not working hard enough. Yeah. <laughs> that was fine. Dude, I couldn't agree more. And it's just like why I wake up every morning and I'm always trying to figure out, like, how do I get somebody else that was in that same position t- to do that and contribute towards the world? And it's just like finding as many different ways. And for me, I, like what I found out is I'm like a, in a way, even though it's it, like I said, it seems completely you know different now. I'm always trying to like try to even get back into my old mindset mm. to see how I think in order to reach those people because you know, like I, uh, you know, I speak all the time. I sometimes speak in schools and like, I, I literally remember when I was like 13, 14 and I was just like sitting in the auditorium and the school brought in like some kind of speaker, my brain would always just like find a way to, to, to rationalize, find it a way to make, get it to, a not, way to not avoid apply, pain, way to avoid pain, like an excuse, a way for, you know, to say, this isn't for you. This is for somebody else. And it's just like, now that I'm in my, that position, I'm always trying to figure out how can I get through that mm. mindset? How can I pierce through that mask that you build up, whether it's through your listening or your body or your money or your girls or whatever that is? Because like, you know, at the end of the day, man, I think this is possible. Like, I think we can eventually live in a world where people are hyper-conscious and it's not like problems are going to go away, but we can just try our best and... I think today with technology, I think it's going to happen. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you are enjoying this episode where Alan and I were lucky enough to sit down in person with the one and only Mark Metry. As we always tell you, head over to the hyperconsciouspodcast.com. Click join hashtag hyperconsciousnation and you will be part of our private Facebook group. If you're looking to mastermind, to get motivation, or to connect with like-minded individuals, this is the group for you. We want to help you. Imagine touch, touching base with a group of people who are all growing towards their goals and dreams consistently. It's really about daily check-ins. Kevin and I are actually about to go live in that group right after this. We are, and I, we got a couple of our episodes this week from members of the group. That's true. We also go on there and we ask basically the group what they're going through because we want to make sure these episodes are as helpful as humanly possible. Also, I want to remind you, September 7th, Your World Within Live yep. 2019. Yep. Evan Carmichael is speaking. I'm speaking. Kevin, Catherine Nash, we're going to be interviewing her on stage. Do not miss this event. Full immersion networking events, there's no way that you're going to go there and then leave the same. I remember reaching out to Anthony Trucks after High Performance Academy in Arizona, and I said, I feel weird, I feel different. He said verbatim, he said, it makes sense that you feel off because you just transformed, and then you went back to an old environment, but you haven't set in. So make sure you come to this event, it's going to change your life. Guys, I always say High Performance Academy. That was the thing that changed my life more than anything. I finally found a room that I felt that I fit in in. I felt like I met people who wanted the same thing as I did. I remember getting home and I was a changed man, so we're trying to do that for you. Absolutely. As well. Do you think that we should get back into the episode? I do with Mark. Let's do it. Talk soon. Bye. You, your main mission, and correct me if I'm wrong, your number one strategic priority is to cure mental illness, right? Mm. And it was something along those lines yeah. with technology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I, I don't know about a hundred percent about mental illness, and I think that word gets uh, right is just totally. Uh, How do you articulate your mission? Just curious. Sorry, I didn't yeah, mean yeah, to, yeah. Um, yeah, so to I articulate wanna, it for him. Yeah, <laughs> this is your mission. No, <gasps> I am you, curious. Thank you for asking, bro. So I wanna I wanna provide people the mental, emotional, psychological tools to get in charge of their mental health so people don't kill themselves. And mm. the reason why I said mental illness is a you know, really interesting word is because you know, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not you know, some kind of doctor or anything like that. You could argue and say that all mental illness is a combination of psychological trauma, uh, a gut body imbalance, uh, blood sugar issues, uh, neurotransmitter issues. Uh, and if you break it down like that, I, it just becomes a systems problem. Like, you know, you, your, I think your background is engineering, right? Yeah. You, you understand, like, you know, if you look at a system, you know, you tackle these three things, you try to minimize these three, and you can attack it. But I think today, a lot of people are falling in the trap of, you know, I am this way because of this reason, and I can't do anything about it. Oh, man. And mm-hmm. if you try to wrap your mind around, 
you know, honestly just saying like, you know, screw labels because the whole point of it is like you literally have to almost switch your identity in a way to live a different life, to live a different version, in to advance. live a different reality. Right. Absolutely. If you don't know the, you can't change the fruit until you know the root cause. And it's like, if we can showcase and figure out, like what you just said. So in neuroscience, there's three things in neuroplasticity. There's structural changes, there's functional changes, and there's chemical changes. You just kind of articulated that the co- root causes of mental health problems come down to your biome, microbiome, okay? That's a chemical problem. Or you've heard of CTE, like structural problems in your brain, right? That, and how that causes depression and eventual suicide a lot of times. Sure. Um, if the system is not functioning, we have to figure out why that is and then get people to believe that they can change it. And the problem with that is, if you don't believe in advance you can change it, why would you search? Exactly. Well, but the the other thing is, like, going back to identity. My identity used to be a fatherless child who couldn't be a man. And a lot of people will reach out and say, like, I was was sexually abused, or I was raped, or I was... I was told this, or I was told that, or my upbringing made me this way. Well, your upbringing made you that way if you focus on the negative side of it. I truly believe, and Evan Carmichael said this when we interviewed him, your biggest pain is your purpose. The, the yeah. thing that you dealt with that almost took you out is what you're, you were put here for to help others with. Mm-hmm. And if you focus on the negative of anything, that you'll, you'll find, if, if I gave you a check for $10 million and you focused on the negative, you'd look at the $4 million you had to pay in taxes. If you looked at the positive, you look at the extra six grand you just got. Six mil. What did Dude. I say? Six grand? <laughs> six mil. They're not taking that much taxes. It's so funny it's because like I, I feel like I hear people all the time say, oh, yeah, I, I, like, I, like this guy won that in lottery, but he got taxed. Like, yeah, right. So it's free it's money. Like, right. Let him get taxed. Yeah. I know. But I think it's what you focus on. Like You're going to feel. Yeah. Dude, honestly, man, like the whole concept of identity is like just at like a matrix level. It really is. And I feel like you... So many different things are going on in my head right now, but <laughs> like one thing is like I feel whether it's some kind of like event where it's like a car accident, although I don't think it has to be some kind of like event. I feel like it could be like just a day example. I don't know if it was in your case where nothing for se happens in that day, but it's just like the accumulation of you getting to this point. And honestly, man, I feel like for me, I had like a like a reality shattering moment where I basically discovered that I literally lived my entire life playing this illusion of my head of how I thought people were going to treat me, my identity. Oh, I'm this person living this life. And like, you know, I think I said on like uh, the podcast that we did on hyperconscious, which I highly recommend people check out by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Of like, dude, your reality is literally what your brain decides it to be, which is an accumulation of your senses, your inputs, your cognitive biases, all coming together. Your unconscious beliefs. Exactly, because your brain right. is completely enclosed by darkness. It doesn't even touch the outside world. So it's literally relying on your eyes, your nose, your your ears, what you have remembered that's going to happen. And it literally just creates a reality. And for me, when I reached a moment where I was like, oh, all that is crap, then you're like, there is no going back point. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you, you said your reality is what you decide it to be. Do you feel like it's more what you let it be? Because it could be either one. I don't know that we necessarily decide. I think we let what happens more often. Right. Right. In in this moment, I could very easily revert to overwhelm and say like, "Oh, we're podcasting with Mark Metry today." When when I have to, well, at one point you were you were a goal, you were a dream for us to to interview <laughs> you, and now we get to hang out with you and, and go to Dunkin' Donuts and lift weights and stuff. So <laughs> at one point that was a dream, that was a goal. But I think it's what you what you let in. Because you're always going to have that, you're always going to have that conflict, and you're always going to have that thing staring at you, yelling like, hey, this is st- failure is always an option. I know people say failure is not an option. Failure is the highest option. It is most likely going to happen. It will happen. So for people like us who face it and do it anyway, we're, we're letting the fact that it could happen not affect us versus like, you know what I mean? I think a lot of people let it happen in the wrong way. Yeah, man. So I mean, I think about this stuff a lot and... Uh Honestly, I think the answer is both. And what I mean by that is like, you know, this could get, you know, pretty like, you know, esoteric, but 
I honestly think that like there's a part of you that's always looking down on you and it's a timeless part of you that has already seen what's going to happen in your life. And so when you're a little kid and you're whatever it is running around, you kind of feel like there's somebody there with you. There's like a higher version of yourself looking at you. You could say it's God. You could say it's the universe. Um, but in that sense, I feel like it's the same thing in the sense of whether you were conscious of it or maybe you weren't, maybe there was a reason why that happened to you. Maybe it's because you actually were trying to let it because some part of your psyche was realizing like, I don't know, Alan or Kevin has to learn this lesson for 18 years in order for him to get to this point to actually be who he wants to mm. be. And without this lesson then he's never going to get there. So I don't, I don't know. This is just like some... Unless you escape it with vices. Because right. I think that when you're in emotional pain, like real emotional spiritual pain, if you don't sit in that long enough to have a breakthrough, I don't think you get that shift. I, you know of the prefrontal cortex, the mammalian brain, and the crocodile brain. Mm. The, the, the prefrontal cortex is the future-oriented one that can project into the future in advance and decide in advance what you want to be, which I would argue all of us did in that deep moment of pain. We decided in advance we want to be the person we needed, okay? The only reason why that happened, I think, from a physiological standpoint, is that we were in enough emotional pain where the brain went, we can't stay here because we're going to die if we stay here. We have to go fix this. And I think eventually a, sh a switch flips, and now all of a sudden you create this 2.0 version of you in the future that now you can chase. But if you escape into a vice, you shut off the prefrontal cortex. I am so passionate about this. What's the difference? The difference is escaping a vice versus developing a virtue when you're in emotional pain. I'm telling you, those accumulation of those choices change the game. I told you that alcohol was my kryptonite. This is why. I had a deep emotional moment recently where I was crying my eyes out and I thought about going to the bar. And I had to say, Alan, if you go to the bar, you're not going to get the breakthrough. You're not going to get the lesson. You're not going to get the shift. And I didn't. Instead, I went to the beach. I watched seagulls. And people came up to me saying, are you okay? Because I was crying. And they could tell, even though I had sunglasses on, I was trying to hide it soft. <laughs> but um, I got the breakthroughs. And I talked to Kevin about it at the airport that night. We missed our flight, or the flight got flight canceled. Got canceled. Yeah, don't don't put that right. on us. <laughs> right, uh, the logistics guy gets mad at that. Um, but I think if I had gone to the bar, I really don't believe we'd even maybe be having this conversation right now because, right, I would have gone into a vice instead of developing myself. Well, we talk about the pain pleasure, uh, the pain the pain pleasure um, pendulum. Pendulum. Jeez, too many words. <laughs> um, I'm gonna rap about that after. How many how many times I remember when. I would get so, Monday would come, it was miserable. Tuesday would come, it was miserable. Wednesday would come, it was miserable. By Thursday, I'm saying, I'm quitting. Friday comes, I'm quitting. Something good would happen to me on Friday. Right. I didn't go all the way to F no. Right. That's why when you, after, afterwards, you have a weekend of going out and binge drinking. When Monday rolls around, you're not as miserable. I think that's why so many people are in unhappy jobs. They're unhappy, but they're not unhappy enough to take a giant risk. When you're debating suicide, when I'm debating suicide, you are at the very end of the pain. You're you all cannot, the way at F now. There's nowhere else to go. So now in your brain, you're like, okay, I've gone this way. That means I can also go the other way. I think most people live in that little area. Mm. And their comfort zone. Yeah, and that and when you don't have enough pain, why would you risk more pain to get pleasure? Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's so funny. So I was, uh, okay, so I want to say two things. So first off, I want to go to what you said about the neocortex and pain. Okay. So this is so interesting. Obviously, we know this. I talk about this all the time. Like, you know, the stereotypical question of like, you know, how do you become a human 2.0, right? Something I always say is that you have to feel the pain of today and the future. And in Simultaneously. the sense of, right, and in the sense of, Today, as in, you know, there's like the way that I view this is like a like a graph, okay? Like a graph. You know, you let's say you're right here, okay? And you know, you're you're going throughout your day, you know, you, I don't know, you wake up, whatever, you go for a cup, whatever, you live your life, something happens, something pushes you, something reminds you, you get triggered from something that's actually, you know, deep in your psychology. Your day is now thrown off, you're having a bad day, now your emotions are going down. Now you're looking for something to raise your emotions up because that's just a natural reaction. You know, you could try to go for a healthier way, let's say, and again, you can abuse this, like, like you know, going to the gym or, or going for a walk because you can abuse anything. So then, but instead, let's say you, um, you know, 
let's say your vice is watching Netflix. Right. You know, and you just succumb and you're now trying to lift your emotions to a point. But what you guys just said is if you don't let this dip long enough and for good reason, like there's a reason why you're in that right. pain. Right. You're never going to get out of there. So it's like you've got to feel that today and go away from the from the vices. You have to sacrifice the vices. And the other part of that is thinking about the future, per, like imagining your future pain. So for me, I imagine, you know, I was 18 at the time. I was like, you know, 12 years from now, just to make it around number 30. Yeah. When I'm 30 years old and I still have not gone over my social anxiety, I'm still on this path of being 220 pounds, probably be like 400 pounds by now or, you know, whatever that would have happened. You know, I'm not going to have any friends. I'm not going to, you know, I'm just going to end up living someplace by myself. I'm going to go to work, just go there, come right after, not going to have any friends, not going to do anything fun. And it's like when you really feel that and you realize like if you don't do anything about it, now that's actually going to happen now mm. because then you begin to realize that, at least for me, it's like you begin to realize that time in and of itself, the way you perceive it is an illusion in the sense of like your brain is always trying to, um, if you have a negative mindset, which I definitely had, your brain is always trying to manipulate you with time. Yeah. And say, oh, you'll have time for that. Or or like, you know, you're too young for that. Or you're too old for that. Or, you know, that already happened. That's too late. And so it's like... and so It's it, all avoidance of yeah, taking action. Exactly, right. exactly. And so it's like when you have played that out and then you get to this moment, you're like, oh, wow, that's actually all an illusion. So the only thing that exists That's why you have right that now. reminder on your phone, right? Boom. That's mm. why. Because it forces urgency in the moment. I have to act now. You just did... You're doing consistently what we call reverse engineering regret yeah that's why i think Bronnie ware's book is so powerful it puts you her ted talk starts with i hate to be morbid but you're gonna die and yeah. so am i <clears throat> we don't know when yeah. some of us will be a year some of us will be 90 years it's not about the goal it's the urgency the goal will create in the now that's i don't care if i become the greatest natural aesthetic men's physique fitness model on the planet i mean i do i want to but it's not it's what it forces me to do now right would i have been in the gym today if i didn't have that dream no no. Would, would this would be a thing? No. And another thing is like, I like what you said about it. It constructs time where it's like you have so much. There's so much time. There's plenty of time for you to do this. The problem is you're you're not taking into effect that it's the habits, not the time. It's if you don't have the habits, the time doesn't matter. You could have a hundred years doing nothing, you'll accomplish nothing. Or give me five years of good habits, you can accomplish everything. So I think that's another thing is like, in five years you will be no different. You probably will be worse off. If you do the same thing, if your habits aren't sound, if you, if you change five of your habits, your life will change drastically. drastically. And I think habits is my jam. Yeah. Like that's yeah. one of my favorite things to talk about because for a long time, I thought people who got super successful just got super successful. Right. I didn't realize behind the scenes they were doing the stuff that nobody else wants to do. Dave Meltzer just post, he just posted this today on his Twitter. He said, yeah, overnight success is real. It just takes 17 years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You saw that? It's yeah. fire. 17. I love that Day's number. Fire. He's so good. Day's He's fire. so good. But He's the one who said time, too. It's a man-made yeah. construct, yeah. and it messes with us. That yeah. blows me away. That That's like, you love coming to the gym with us, right. right? And we love picking your brain about business and podcasting. But the thing is, you you see us at the gym. We see you at your speeches and your podcasting. We don't see what we do behind the scenes. So that's when we're in a room, that's the beauty of it. You get to tell us what you're doing behind the scenes. You say, Kevin, how do you, what kind of foam rolling do you do? Like what kind of, right. what kind of right. stretching and mobility? That's the stuff that is actually, should be showcased more. Right, right. that's what I'm, I, love I know, that's, that. that's, that's what like, Alan's trying to You're rubbing off on me. You're looking at the fruit and it's like, oh, yeah. that fruit would be really nice. But it's like, what, but wait, right. what is the root? Right. I told, uh, I did a speech with a bunch of high school athletes recently on conscious leadership. I had a slide, ready? I said, who in this room loves Tom Brady? I put Tom Brady's picture up with him with the trophy, and everyone's hand went up. Next slide. How to sustain a lifetime of peak performance, the TB12 method. Who here has read his book? No hands went up. This was harsh. This was hardcore. And everyone went, oh, my God. I said, I know. I love Tom Brady, too. Okay? I have friends who love Tom Brady who take shots to Tom Brady. Guess what? Tom Brady almost never drinks. Yeah. I don't want you to just love Tom Brady. I want you to love his habits. And I said... A lifetime of sustained peak performance. Aren't you curious? The six-time champion, we see him for 30 seconds on the podium. We don't see the 30 years it took to get there. I want you to be more curious about what he's doing in private rather than the success he has in public. And if I can get the world to see that, that's like my thing. It's my jam. Now, do you think social media helps with that? Or does it hinder? 
I mean, I don't know. I think it's just a tool, and it's always a double-edged tool, and especially, you know, with a tool that's that powerful as social media. Like, you know, we were just talking about, uh, you know, like wars and stuff going on. Like, you could debate and say that a big reason why a lot of those wars happened was because of centralized media control mm. and propaganda. And you could say that a king took uh, basically all of the young men that were able to fight and basically manipulated them and said, you know, potentially, again, we got to go invade this place because all these people are, right. you know, bastards. They're trying to invade us. They're trying to take our land or they do this. Whether or not that's thing. true is exactly, exactly. This is, yeah. Ugh. Right. And so, like, you know, I remember last time I talked about, uh, or maybe, I don't know if I did, basically, like, social media just completely changing the world. Like, you know, where I'm from or where my parents are from, Egypt, they literally had a revolution that happened in 2000. 11 that started from facebook and so it's like with a tool that powerful there are gonna be you know pros and cons yeah. positives yeah. and negatives, all things right? pros and cons. um honestly i feel like i feel like the way that i have had to for me be authentic and just how i am all the time after living a life of being socially anxious and not living not living within my own skin not living a life that i know is true to me like like you said mm. brawny brawny said exactly i, I feel just like, i feel like it's actually <laughs> i feel like it's actually the same thing and what i mean by that is this so when i showed up to a classroom for example in like the fourth grade and i would walk in a classroom and i'd sit down i'd see all these kids next to me right all your classmates everyone you know again it depends everyone is trying to wear the you know the the best clothes if that's what they're into everyone's trying to wear you know, the best, uh, you know, whatever it is, jacket, right, whatever's everyone's, cool. everyone's got, got to have like the best baseball cards. Everybody's got to have the greatest body, the greatest car, whatever it is. And it's like, they're just, everyone is just fronting because nobody actually wants to you know, <laughs> right. let them see the real inside, yeah, especially right. kids that haven't been taught, uh, different emotional tools. Uh, and even just adults in general now in social media, it's literally the same thing. I look on somebody's Instagram and it's like, you know, look at, you know, look at look at look at me fronting the same exact thing, but right. it's not actually going the uncover. And so, honestly, I think you can do both, and that's why I think with us with social media, we're trying to highlight both sides of the spectrum. Yeah, you know, right. and so I think it could definitely go both ways. But I honestly don't even think, other than the fact that you now have access to it in your pocket on demand, no restrictions. Other than that, I feel like this has been happening forever, especially with the perception of media. And you, we were talking about this before, of mm -hmm. like, you know. Basically, people had access to a TV and they turned it on and there was this girl and she looked like this and she wore like this and she talked in this manner. Or whether it's a romantic comedy and the guy is acting like this and the girl is acting like that. Right. That's what we saw. And so um, we began to act like that. And I just feel like with social media, it's now diversified that. It's now opened it up mm. for everybody to do it. And there are great things and there's yep. also some pretty weird things that are horrible that are going on. And so it's a really powerful tool, man. It's the thing crazy. I would tell everyone listening right now is that the social media is never the full reality. Even if it's true, it's not the whole truth. You could look at my Instagram, who someone who tries to be authentic, and you're going to see the one photo where my abs look best out of the hundred I took. Because... Marketing versus reality, it's it's the nature of marketing. Look oh, at the dude. McDonald's sign of the burger versus the thing you get. I know, I know. Right? And so I think, unfortunately, technology has evolved to a point where we are able to showcase things that are not real in order to sell things that are. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I have something I want to say on this because I am. Um, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a marketer, right? Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know. Got to be. Yeah, right. And we're trying to learn that from you. Right. And, 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 <laughs> right. and like, you know, you could just say that marketing is basically, uh, you know, perception, right? And I'm just, I'm just looking at this post that I made a while ago that's about toxic marketing. Ooh. And basically it's in the sense of like, you know, the industry that you guys are in right now with, uh, with different kinds of, um, you know, fitness and, uh, and, and diet packages that basically try to, uh, you know, almost hand people uh, a, an option. And it's like, hey, go for that. And if you don't do that, you're a loser. Right. And they may not say that exactly, but deep down, like in your psychology, your brain gets this. And take it a step deeper. So when I interviewed Mark Manson, the author of The Subtle Art of Not Giving Up, like one of the top books of our time, mm. 
he basically talked about this. And he said that marketing has gotten so good mm. that it, you know, our brain has a logical side, it has an emotional side. Yeah. Marketing has gotten so good at bypassing that logical side yep. and just going straight into the emotional psychology. Right. And it's like when you are living a life and like, you know, again, I have, I literally have friends that literally study what word to use. How do you phrase this? How Same. do you write this? Yep. Right. Yep. We, and like, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just and needs there's to no be. way to win without it either. Exactly. when it comes yeah. to business, it's very oh, it difficult to your compete. intent. Right. It, it, intention, exactly right. pure intentions are yeah. everything. Right. And it's like, you know, I heard something Jay said, he said, he said, the smartest people, the most successful people in the world, they always choose to, Learn over entertainment. The biggest yes. losers in the world t- yep. choose entertainment over learning. It's your E&E ratio. What's your ratio? I need mine to be 80-20. 80% wait, 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 education, wait, 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 oh, education oh, versus entertainment. Oh, How often are you trying to be entertained versus educated? Right now, I am being educated by you, 100%. I'm going to leave this conversation learning more. Oh, sure. And same with him. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be a bit better 2.0 version of myself. I am more hyper-conscious because of this, this podcast right well, here's here. the thing. For me, it's both. And that's exactly the point. Oh. What if mm. what if you can make the things that are learning entertaining? That's what I'm trying to do. Interesting. Maybe a little bit of podcast is a conversation. Like you had like, fun in the gym while learning from me. Exactly. Interesting. You could do that through stand up comedy. You could do that through rap videos, through music. Right. right. And so it's like just trying to find all the ways to do that. Wow. And yeah. I had a breakthrough right I, there. I wanted to that was bring fire. something it's not one or the other. Um <laughs> something I, I think it was um Leadership by John Maxwell I was reading the other day mm. and he was talking about the difference between a growth mindset and a um, goal mindset. And I think that's what a lot of people see when they see marketing. It creates a goal mindset. What do I have to do in order to get that? Mm. When a growth mindset is how far can I take this? When I started this podcast, I didn't have a goal of being rich. I wanted to see like I wanted to see how far I could take it. I told Alan I never knew we would make it to 200 episodes. You have a a growth mindset. You're seeing how far you can take your life and your education and your lessons and your experiences. Alan is the same. And how many people you can help with mental health? Yeah, but like, most people are looking at the next goal. What do I have to become in order to get a Ferrari? You could become a thousand different things. Right. What do I have to become in order to change the world and impact it in a positive manner where people with remember these vehicles. me? Right. Right. With these passions. I just wanted it's, to bring that because that's something I've been really focused lately on. Like, you'll know when somebody's goal chasing versus growth chasing. Right. You'll know immediately almost. And one of the things that I think is, you know, the Abraham Lincoln quote, if you give me six hours to chop down a tree, I'm spending four sharpening the axe. Yeah. People are not sharpening the axe enough. Right. I'm telling you, even me right now, I'll be, I'll be transparent. I have not spent enough time reading and learning in solitude because I'm so damn busy and I can tell that it's a bottleneck. If I don't level up my skills, if you're listening right now, you are at the center of your universe and your personal development set point in any given arena is the bottleneck to your success. If you want a Ferrari, that's great. You have to be like my mentor who never gave a crap about Ferraris. He cared about mastery of wealth creation. Guess what? Now he has a Ferrari. He cared more about impacting people and growing businesses and that's why he has a Ferrari. That's a byproduct of something bigger. So that's, I guess, question your incentive and try to ask yourself. Uh, Kevin's doing boomerangs. Trying to do a little social media. He's doing boomerangs here. for days, <laughs> which is not distracting yeah, at sorry, all. I'm sorry, <laughs> can I ask you something? Gotta do the social Please. media. Do you, ever, do you ever feel like you get too serious? Like you take things too seriously? Sometimes. Or do you, because c- c- like for me, I feel like, um, you know, I feel like you can... I, so self development is fantastic, but I also feel like many things in life you can always abuse it, and I feel like a lot of people can hop on this like cycle, this track of just like, boom, 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 and become almost become like a caricature of themselves and lose sight of why they actually started and just end up pushing themselves way too far, and they just end up thinking they have to create something that. They don't actually have to do because they're looking at um, like everybody on Instagram through that toxic marketing of like, I have to be this. Mm. So I think that the right questions will stop that from happening. So I have a journaling practice where I say, what am I doing right now that I might regret? What am I not doing right now that I might regret? If you want to stay true to not falling into that trap and stay true to your true self, you have to consistently ask. You have to consistently reverse engineer regret, which you're doing with that reminder. Every single time yeah. your phone says you're going to die eventually, that's what you're doing. You're going, oh, shit, I can't. It's like the frog in the pot of boiling water. 
you ju- you jump out every time that thing reminds you. Sometimes it sucks, man. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's hard. <laughs> well, it has to. It's it's right. it's feedback. The one thing you're not doing, and you, it doesn't seem like you do often, is fear feedback or avoid feedback. Maybe you fear it, but you don't. I think Alan and I talk about that all the time. The more feedback get you get, the better you will get, because you're going to have the ability to look at it and say, "That is not the result I desired. That is the result I desired." One of the two, and then you make a change accordingly. You either get better, or you do do again. Like you do it again. Or oh, just so you know, we're coming up on an hour here. Okay, you tried to articulate this earlier. I think an intimate relationship is the ultimate feedback. Yes, it's the mirror. Because when you care that much and you're that dude, I'll tell you what I said this at the speech. I said when I fell in love, that was when I grew the most. Yeah, because I cared so much that I had to look at all my shortcomings. Because the level of love that I fell in, I was not. I was. N- I didn't have the skills to sustain and grow, genuinely. To me, mastery is the following quote. Can I consistently and sustainably produce the outcomes that I want and enjoy the experience? If the answer is no, then you haven't mastered it. And mastery is forever. You know that. Yeah. Um, you interviewed Robert Greene, who wrote yeah, the book Mastery. Crazy. Yeah, unbelievable. Do but you want to do like another 15 on relationships? You want to jump to relationships um, for a bit? You got time or what? Mm. It's up to you. I, I know you got your bedtime. I don't want to keep you up, man. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, no, let's skip that. All right. So, so yeah, so... um. So I mean I would I would love it if you guys could share like just each one of you like as we wrap up what what has been some kind of uh like an exercise that you have put yourself through and you had some kind of a breakthrough if anything comes to mind. Oh yeah man. The last the share last one. 2 years of my life. So Alan and I got tickets to go to Brendan Burchard's High Performance Academy in Arizona. I hadn't flown in 20 years. I was terrified. I had never been to a networking event and I didn't want to go. If I didn't go, I would not be sitting here talking to you today. I can guarantee it. I bet my entire life savings on it because I, I learned so much about myself. I left that room saying, I belong here. I belong here. I was hugging people. I was crying. I found my people finally. <laughs> and that's, yeah. So do something that scares you because it'll probably make more of you than you thought. Yeah. And here's the thing. If he didn't have the mission, do you want to say it for the podcast? Because if he didn't yeah. have the reason to go, I had to convince him. And to me, sales and persuasion is about taking the other person, with more, helping them get more of what they want. Kevin wants to be a successful podcaster. One of the most successful, if not the, the most, most successful in the world. I want to have the most successful podcast of all time, not just for a life of freedom for myself, but to prove to countless others that they can have whatever life that they are willing to work for. So if he didn't have that dream, there's no way I could have gotten him to go get on a plane. Yep. We had to go on, what, five planes yeah. to get you to yeah, and five from Five planes that? in Crazy. five days. And that was one of his biggest fears. Your desire to serve something greater than yourself will force you to face the fears that are necessary for you to face in order to become the person you've always been wanting to be. That's that's like something that I'm that's my thing. What he just said, it mine's the same. I have learned more from coaching my clients and serving them than I ever have from being coached or from reading books or from any of that shit. I learn so much by trying to help other people, it's not even funny. It's it's everything. If you have a genuine desire to help others and you live there, you it, you will get more than anyone you help. Fire. Teaching is the highest form of learning. Exactly. 100%. Where can people check out you guys' stuff, learn more about you? Oh, sure. Hyper, www.thehyperconsciouspodcast.com. We have a private Facebook group called Hyperconscious Nation. You can find that at the website or on Facebook. You can find me at Never Quit Kid on Instagram. Never, Never quit. quit. Um, again, Alan Lazarus, I'm on the Big Six, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Snapchat. But the best place to find us is probably Instagram. So that's at alazarus88 on Instagram. That's A-L-A-Z-A-R-O-S-8-8. DM us anytime. Yes. And the podcast, the Hyperconscious Podcast. Yes. Apple, iTunes, Spotify. Spotify, YouTube, and SoundCloud. Check it out. Check it out. Highly recommend it. I recommend these guys. These guys are awesome. Much love, brother. Thank you guys for coming. Thank in you my for life. having us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mark. 100%. This has been your host, Mark Metry. Woo! <laughs> Talk Woo! soon. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you enjoyed this episode where Alan and I were lucky enough to sit down in person with our good friend, Mark Metry. Up next, we have a five minute clinic on the word anticipation. Folks, so Tony Robbins, one of my heroes, has a thing that he says Have you ever made the mistake of playing a video game with a child? If you have, They get their first turn, and 45 minutes later, you get your turn. They're killing all the bad guys. They know who's coming and what. Um, That's the power of anticipation. Then you get your turn, 
and you don't know where the bad guys are coming and you die in five seconds. So that's kind of like life. If you've never played a certain game before, whether it's football or basketball or podcasting, whatever arena you're in, fitness is a big one. Your ability to anticipate challenges in advance, this is actually a big part of coaching, believe Ooh. it or not, is the power of anticipation. The more aware you are in a given arena, in other words, the more hyper-conscious you are, the more you can anticipate challenges in advance. I think Alan did a great job, and I'm going to let him end on that, and we hope you will enjoy. Talk soon. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for listening to another episode of the Hyperconscious Podcast. Going hyperconscious will absolutely change your life because if you understand why something is the way it is, now you have the power to change it. If you going hyperconscious with us has changed your life in any way, please share this episode with one of your friends because the more people that go hyperconscious, the better this world's going to be for everybody. And if you would kindly leave us a five star review on iTunes, that would help us make more people hyperconscious and we would be greatly appreciative. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>